Now we have the archivists and team from here, from within the institution. I have collaborated with them. So it is particularly emotional for me to be able to introduce them. They will be talking about an archive which is called the Bayer Archive and which has precisely an acquisition fashion which is quite peculiar. They will be talking about it. A way of peculiar way of processing and a current workflow which they will also talk about. I won't be doing any spoilers of this. So at any rate, and remembering matters dealt with by Laura Miller, the word stratification, which is also hard for them, will pop up here and there. And there will also be very interesting reviews on the type of classification diagram or table that can be used in an archive that documents the graphic work of Pablo Picasso, which I assume you all know. So here you are, they have the floor. Um, here I leave you with Bridget Bayer and the archival interpretation they are doing of, well, documentalisting work of the graphic works of Pablo Picasso. So, do you agree with that? Yes, we agree very much. You have some stairs over there. Yeah, I just realized. Well, we want to talk about many things and we don't have a lot of time. So, Nuria and myself will be introducing a work we are carrying out jointly, which is a proposal, non-functional way of classifying within the framework of modern archive. It will be a classification of our funds, as Jorge said, the Bridget Bayer Fund. In order to understand that stratigraphy, we want to explain the itinerary we have followed and our reflections so that you can understand things much better. Having this at the back is quite difficult. All right, so the Picasso Museum starts with its strategies in 2009. We had lots of documents, but the archive had not been organized, as happened in many other museums as well. It's not something that we're not doing well here. So shortly after starting with the archiving strategies, no, it's we have to go back there. Yeah. Okay, so shortly after starting with his archiving strategies in 2011, two years later, with the opening of the research center, which is the umbrella within the archive, there were a sort of declaration of intent with this exhibition uh, in 1936, Picasso, an exhibition with the idea of explaining or communicating that the museum wanted to move towards this idea of archiving and exhibiting as a whole, that archives are part of collections and in whole, that uh, the museum considers archives to be part of all the documents. So despite this declaration of intent and the exhibitions as mentioned previously in the introduction, we wanted to place a focus. We thought it was moment or time to focus on the organization work in order to properly preserve, guarantee access, and also work with this new perspective. So in 2020, we already had, or the museum had, compiled uh, Picasso archives that were consolidated with an optimum way of management following our archivistic um, guidelines. That's when we thought we could place emphasis on this idea of archive as a life entity that keeps changing with a fluent representation socially built, all these things that we have heard about this morning and that we will continue to hear throughout the day and tomorrow as well. So. One of the projects, or the main project that we proposed and we're working on, which is archival practice in art, was something like this. And it is true that 
for many years now, the museums around the world work along these lines. And here, there's a pioneer project we all know about uh, by the Antoni Tapias Foundation, Cultures of Archive, by Nuri Anguita and Jorge Blasco. They were the ones validating it. And I think it is also very important, uh, the role carried out by MACBA, guided by Manolo Borgievier, the director back then, and Mena Davila, who is also here with us, of considering archives as part of the collection, because up until that moment, that was not the case. Despite all this, we considered that we had to go one step beyond that, or there was a turning point there, which was introducing archive as a science in this practice. So this title for us is very important. So archive, uh, because we want to be practical, practice, and art, because we have been uh, working on this but at the end of the day, a classification diagram is a classification diagram everywhere. So the idea here was to find some tools that could further adapt to what art archives represent. So we started working. We prepared a small group to be uh, more smooth in our work, uh, us and Jorge Blasco. That's why he knows this project very much. And we relied on archival science and its main principles. We collected all these reflections and research and investigation that has been carried out for many years, as we heard before. And with our experience and our knowledge, we wanted to analyze and develop the main archival principles which are in the classification diagrams and stratification um, structures. So we did this with our fund in order to be practical. So we chose the Brigitte Bayer Fund. So who was Brigitte Bayer? I'm going to explain this very quickly in order to understand stratigraphy. Brigitte Leclerc, known as Brigitte Bayer, was an extraordinary woman born in Paris of the intellectual Parisian and she'd studied um, politics and some circumstances in life. In the year 1975, when she was 40, she got in touch with the Picasso world. She was one of the three people selected to do the inventory of the legacy of Picasso's works when he passed away. She became specialized in the graphic works of Picasso. And when that legacy was executed, the gallerist David Hadkoffer of the Berner Gallery in Switzerland commissioned her to prepare the catalog of the graphic works of Picasso that was unfinished because of the passing away of Bernard Heiser, the author. So Brigitte Bayer collected all the work done by Bernard Heiser and devoted her time to more investigation and research. And in 1996, she'd already published the seven volumes which are the entire catalog of the graphic work of Picasso. And she became the great specialist in the world of uh, works of Picasso. So nowadays, this catalog, we all know it as La Bayer. A Bayer. So this archive is like a travel throughout the research work on the works of Picasso. And this is the creation factory of what basically this recent catalog uh, ended up being. In 2015, David Leclerc, nephew of Brigitte Bayer, counseled by Paco Res, gave this fund, this archive, to the Picasso Museum of Barcelona. But this was a very long process, a three-year-long process. We started working in 2012, and we finished in 2015. And it was very complex because many different stakeholders were part of it, and different countries as well, French heritage. And this meant that we got to know really well the process of archiving and we entered into the social life of the archive and not only the documents themselves. So, in archival science, we say this is the archival story of the archive. This conditioned us, of course, and on the other hand, it also helped us to make this an ideal example to propose a type of classification that could be further adapted. I will be tr trying to explain this very quickly so Nuria has time. The 
training process because this allows us to understand this stratigraphy here. In the first part of the last century, Edgar Hartkoffer in Vienna commissioned Bernard Heisen, a Swiss art historian, the uh, classification of graphic works of Picasso Heiser, of course, with the idea of publishing the recent catalog Heiser started to work and prepared the structure of all the different files of the graphic works of Picasso up until then, what Picasso had produced so far, and he focused essentially in the first year, so that in 1967, when Heiser passed away, they'd already edited the first two volumes that gather the graphic works since uh, the first work to 1934. On the following year, Heiser passed away, and that's when for a few years, this uh, is all blocked, and Mr. Koffel commissions in 1980 Brigitte Bayer to continue with this classification. So what does she do? She collects all these files. She had a lot of information, plus the two recent catalogs that had been published. And she performs the research, but includes more documentation. So around 12,000 pho photographies of all the different engravings by Picasso. And she turns them into catalog files, including graphic works of um, other artists, such as Burlor, Comblot. And she continues to work. And in 1996, she published the seven uh, volumes plus the addendum. When this task is completed at a specific moment, all this documentation uh, is taken by Brigitte Bayer to Paris with her. She lived in Paris, but that's not the end of her work. She continues to classify and to produce documentation. In fact, the catalogs become the archival documents because she starts writing, and this increases up until her death in 2005. She passes away in 2005, and her nephew puts everything in new boxes for eight years, thinking about what the best place for it would be, and he does the donation in 2012. We start working with him. He also worked with us at the fund, and that was also very interesting, and he even says he said something that was very interesting. He had a very close relationship with his aunt, but she really got to know her professionally when he read the archive and he was there with him alive. That's what he said. Anyway, in 2015, all these documents are filed into the archive. So just very quickly and in a summarized way, we can see that m many agents intervened. There was more than one producer, of course, Bayer, of course, but Bayer was also an author, but there was more than one author as well. Heiser was also an author. This is clearly a collective archive, despite the fact that it is a personal archive. I haven't said that in this donation agreement all parties so Corfel, David Leclerc, the Picasso family, because all the photographies belong to the Picasso family. And ourselves, we all agreed that this would be called the Brigitte Bayer Archive and the photography as classifying element, which was also very interesting, is somehow a fund claiming this classifying figure, despite the fact that we are talking about an artist such as Pablo Picasso. All this. Oh, with all this, we saw that uh, we couldn't perform a functional classification given all the function generated by the documentation because, amongst other things, all the documentation would be together and we could not guarantee the order and logic of work of their artists and producers. So we started thinking that perhaps it shouldn't be functional, but rather the work processes or workflow in order to finally create or so that the um, researcher can go through the archive as we did. So that is why we propose this stratigraphic classification. Nuria will be talking about. Thank you, Sylvia. Good morning, everyone. As Sylvia said, 
having a functional diagram of an archive that has one single purpose, which is to have all the uh, graphic work of Pablo Picasso, it was just falling short. And we thought that it couldn't depict the real complexity of this archive fund. So that's what, when we decided that instead of representing the function, we wanted to explain the creation process amongst other things because the creation process also explained the scientific work and task of classification. All the documents that we have found in this fund, found in this fund is specific documentation around this scientific activity that was done by Bridget Bayer and Heiser. And this scientific activity, therefore, is the one shaping the fund. So we wanted to find a way, a different way, and Sylvia comes from archaeology, I'm a historian, and so we tried to think of a tool that was different. So using the fact that stratigraphy studies rocks and that identifies and describes sequentially, both vertically and horizontally, the rocks and formation, this allowed us to perform a very expressive analogy with a research process. Research also takes place by layers. So the research with it, which is done around an area or a topic could be done in the same way. So it is a different sedimentation of layers. So. Here we have the stratigraphy. We proposed a vertical division first or distribution, which is time distribution. So it is done by eras as in a geological formation. And you know that eras, by definition, are a history period characterized by great innovation in the ways of living of a society. And this allowed us to represent this distribution by eras, well, two different elements. On the one hand, what Silvia was saying, this archive that is a collective archive, so we have two authors, Heiser and Bayer. So we had a first era going from 1930 to 1968, Heiser, and then um, 1980 to 1996 by Bayer, and then another post Bayer that goes from 1997 to 2005. Apart from reflecting this change of authorship, eras also allow us to explain something that is very important, which is the change of material conditions when it comes to developing research. Hazel works on the second quarter of the 20th century, so years, the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s. So it is an analogic research. The capacity that he has will not be the same as uh, the one that Brigitte by has in the last quarter of the 20th century. She was a very analogic woman, but she used the computer. But it is true that she she didn't use much many computers, but fax and phone, yes, and that got her in touch with institutions from all around the world in Australia and the US, and this allowed her to fine tune much more in her research. There's another element changing the elements of the research, which is the passing away in 1973 of Pablo Picasso. Hi, sir is fortunate enough to know Picasso and asking a few questions. He doesn't have the same amount of information as Bayer will have later on because she works after the passing away of Picasso. And with the privilege Sylvia mentioned before, she is the person that within the Picasso legacy is in charge of the graphic work. So she has access to practically and virtually all the graphic work production of Picasso visually to the different stages. Um, to the plates and the letters and private documents of the artist. So this means that the capacity of being precise when it comes to classification, of course, it's not the same with Bayer than with Heiser. So let's move on to the different layers now. Thank you, Silvia. So in the Heiser era, we have split that into three layers. The first one are the classification files of Heiser. He 
basically constructs all the different classification files up until his death. He cannot obviously cover the last uh, production period by Picasso, but he assembles all the different files and all these documents. Here we can see an example of a file. At first, he was working in three colors. Then he made it more simple, working with one color. And then in the second layer, we have uh, gone by different documentary typologies because the documentation stages also can explain this knowledge accumulation process. And the second highest layer are the recent catalogs, as Sylvia said before. Uh, he published volume one and volume two within the buyer era, there are more layers. She can fine tune much more regarding documents. The first layer are the classification files of Heiser. So we see them once again because what Brigitte Bayer does, as you can very well see on the image, is to make the most of these files, the existing ones, and she writes on top. She corrects and comments, adds information whenever she finds new information, and she works on the existing material prepared by Hai. So we also like to use this material because Bayer seems to be working with this idea of reusing paper. And she's always intervening on top of the existing documents. Anyway, the next important layer is the photography layer. Photographies also speak about this material change of the different stages in time and the use that we make of technology. Here, photography is very important for Heiser. They were practically an identification element. Bayer works with bigger photographies. We will, well, practically they replace the works, of course, because she uses them to document and do work. And it's uh, such an important element that sometimes the uh, photography becomes the file. She writes on the back of the photo and she makes comments. So photogra photography is a very important element as well. On the blue layer, as you can see there with the catalogs, that's would more likely belong to the Heiser era, because, but we've had them here because we have a very obvious case of a document that has been published and that should go to the library, but Bayer works on it in a very intense way. And once again, she reuses the material supports and she works on these catalogs so that they become original documents. They're not a published work or a book, but they become original documents with uh, original information that is very valuable. The last layer of the buyer era are the addition of re uh, recent catalogs. And this layer is what will allow us to move on to the next one, the post-buyer era from 1997 to 2005, as Sylvia said before. And what happens with buyer is that she becomes an encyclopedia of knowledge that is so vast regarding Picasso's work that everyone wants to get in touch with her. Once the work is completed, which is so big in, uh, of an artist that is so extensive, she becomes a um, worldwide reference. She continues to research because she receives lots of inputs from the outside, private collectors, museums. They turn to her to check information, to contrast information. And once again, with this idea she, and with her published work, she works on it once again as with a notebook. She self-corrects all the time, and she reviews and proofreads everything. It is almost like obsessive uh, in terms of perfectionism. She reaches a level of detail and precision, which won't be easy to um, actually improve or correct. And now we are going to move towards the end. Can you please show the first one, Sylvia? The first, the first one where, where we can see everything. We want to leave this stratigraphy as an open structure because we believe that knowledge is endless and unlimited and 
as we have more and more researchers coming, these different layers will grow, amongst other things. And David Leclerc explained this because Bayer knew very clearly that she wanted her archive to be alive. And that happens when you work on it and continue to uh, give a meaning to it. Uh, our presentation is over now. I don't know whether there will be any questions, but I believe that you can ask any questions you have now in our debate panel. But I did want to thank all the team that has worked in the Bayer Fund, apart from Sylvia and me, Diego Bolaño and Raquel Revuelta. Thank you very much. Okay.